So let's get started. Uh, there's plenty of information to cover. So, so let's let's get started with with that. And uh, so, first of all, the the topics for today. We go through the the after interaction. We go into innovation, mega trends, why startups, startups as a category. We talk about more about the terminology. Uh, look at the startup ecosystems conceptually. Uh, how is that kind of uh, easiest to wrap your head around? Uh, we talk about the typical organizations, their roles, uh, the, the challenges with navigating ecosystems from different parties' perspectives. Uh, we discuss about uh, the, the, some of the key challenges with the, the siloed. Um, organizations and information uh, from structural perspective um, and then we focus on getting more on the, the development perspective of the ecosystems um, um, and then look various different uh, key elements of that development from mapping to measuring to collecting data and so forth. <clears throat> so this is the, the main topics for today. Uh, as a background information uh, from myself, so I am more uh, have more than 20 years of entrepreneurship, innovation entrepreneurship behind myself through several ventures over the years, uh, uh, always building innovations, building those internationally, but also uh, more than 10 years of uh, uh, developing local ecosystems and working as, as as a mentor, advisor, and also a support service uh, provider, so developing different support functions, instruments, funding tools, uh, programs, event concepts, and so forth, and really also doing the the one-to-one -one advisory and mentoring for for new startups in in high volumes. So really to find also in person experience and then combining that from a broad set of statistical perspectives and, and so forth. And then also in addition to, to working in, in uh, different support organizations and in a mentor, mentor and investor capacity as well, uh, also working with uh, more like a higher perspective instruments specifically uh, when being part of designing European Commission Horizon 2020 uh, support functions and funding instruments as well. So, so this really has given uh, a good perspective from various different uh, angles and levels and roles uh, to also contribute for, for the journey of uh, startup commerce. <clears throat> so, for, for several years, the, the overall development of innovation uh, has been moving from these closed structures and uh, into more open innovation and more collaborative ecosystems. And, uh, and, the, and the, there are still a lot of, um, because a lot of the key organizations in the ecosystems are, are very old and traditional sometimes. Uh, more than 100 years of old uh, from universities and so forth. There's a lot of also structural legacy and structural history for, for some of how the organizations and, and some of the patterns still exist today, specifically around innovation, for example, around uh, uh, releasing IP from, uh, from universities and research activities um, that are still for the most part, in the most part of the world, still very much built around the old closed innovation processes where big companies buy the research IPs out of the universities uh, with the model called uh, technology transfer. So a lot of those models still, even today, haven't yet really changed to support the, where the innovation really happens and where that research actually can come a commercial uh, outcomes. So this is uh, one of the areas where, where we still see a lot of challenges <clears throat> even today. 
even though we already know that a lot of the innovation that happens in the marketplace and innovations that get to the marketplace actually start and happen more and more outside of uh, closed structures, both uh, outside of big organizations, outside of big companies. And, uh, and it's also important when we talk about startups and, and ecosystems to spend a little bit of time in bringing clarity to terminology that uh, is heavily used in this context. And, uh, and, and some of the key terms are uh, exactly innovation and how that term is used and what does it mean to different people. And we look at this from the lens of how it's different from an idea. So uh, also we see a lot of the different terms uh, or mixed use of the word invention and innovation. And there's a very big difference between these two words, but oftentimes for a lot of people who are working in uh, developing ecosystems or support functions around uh, startups and innovation, entrepreneurship in general, uh, oftentimes these terms are, are, are not used clearly enough and that can create a lot of misunderstanding uh, in, a, in a broad scale, specifically if these types of uh, unclarity is all the way at the policy level or funding instruments level and so forth. <clears throat> So the main difference between just an idea or an invention is that it is not validated um, that it actually has value. Uh, and what that means that it can be a really fancy or good looking or interesting thing, but the main difference is that it's actually not validated. So it's only hypothetical or theoretical value that is being uh, described or communicated. And innovation, on the other hand, is validated. So that is the big difference what separates the innovation word from invention word. So invention is not proven in the marketplace, it's not tested, it has no value other than a theoretical value. Whereas innovation is actually validated, it is proven that it is valuable. And the the to open that a bit more, it's, it's innovation is either a renewed method or process or business model or product validated to create new value compared to previous solution. So the validation is really key factor to separate the uh, invention from innovation. And also that proven or that validation, what does it mean more specifically? It means that not only is the value that it is created, identified and validated, but it's also because of that, to be able to validate, it is also known to whom or to what uh, that value is being created. So, <clears throat> so basically it's not only the value itself, but also to where that value is actually being delivered. And through that is also basically the validation of, of the actual value. And then also how that value is being generated. So uh, of course, for innovation to work, it is, it is delivering new value on a constant basis. Uh, so what value to whom and how. And this is exactly, uh, pretty much everything that startups do uh, in the early phases is they focus on taking an idea or invention or research findings or whatnot and trying to validate that and getting it past the point where they know what value they can deliver, what value the idea delivers, to whom that value actually means something is valuable and how are they going, how are they doing that? So with what product or with what service or with what other method. And uh, <clears throat> when we talk about innovation also, it's good to understand uh, the different categories and types of innovations. So 
the categories first, uh, they can be iterative, lateral or disruptive. And iterative is the most common type of innovation that you can see happening. Uh, for example, uh, iPhone, when it came out initially, it, it could be considered disruptive, but we can all pretty much agree that for the past years, it has been mainly iterative innovation. Uh, so just next better version of the previous uh, innovation. So it's iteratively getting better, um, um, but it's not not to be considered disruptive anymore. So now it's a new status quo uh, on iterative development. And uh, something like Uber uh, as a business model when that came out can also be seen as disruptive uh, model that the actual thing that it was done all the time going from A to B and even using the same or similar vehicles than uh, with Uber, uh, the model was disruptive because it, it, it changed uh, many of the other fundamental parts of the overall delivery. And uh, the lateral innovation uh, is then when you take uh, an existing innovation where it is already known that we can deliver this value uh, with this model to this uh, group of users or consumers or companies. And we take that typically from one industry to another or to a different um, set of assets. And as an example, um, you could take uh, the Uber model and apply that for helicopters, or you could apply that for for um, boats, or you could apply that for for a different type of setting, uh, and run a new company out of that, and then you would be working with lateral innovation. <coughs> so these are the three different categories, and then of course, as already mentioned, that innovation can also be different types, so it can be uh, iterative technology innovation, uh, where also applying a disruptive business model uh, with a lateral process. Uh, so, in fact, the point is that uh, the overall uh, innovation can be also a combination, or the overall delivery uh, of that innovation can be a combination of multiple uh, of these working together. So uh, it's not necessarily that it's only a lateral process innovation to a new industry, uh, but it can also include elements then on the business model side or in the, in the market position side and, and so forth. So there's a few examples here, the technology, business model, process and position. So taking from one industry to another or taking from uh, uh, from expanding to another country and so forth. But there can also be more of the types. So it's really important how to, to very specifically understand the innovation and then also more broadly the different types and categories of innovations because those are of course the, the, the parts that startups are actually building. <clears throat> So what we have covered here uh, has, has been this, this bigger transition that has been happening with these more closed innovation ecosystems uh, into more broadly and more open startup ecosystems. And, uh, and then we'll uh, dive deeper into uh, what, the, what the startup ecosystem actually is, is about. But generally, uh, the visualization here is to communicate also uh, where that innovation traditionally has ha been happening more, so through bigger companies and public sector organizations who have had bigger resources in past, they have been the ones really uh, being able to de de deliver, develop those innovations where uh, specifically the reason has been that it has been so expensive, uh, resource intensive uh, in the past, but with all of the technology developments and uh, 
innovations on top of innovations with business models, with open source softwares, with uh, software code, uh, uh, free distribution, creative commons, uh, general cost of technology, new platforms, new channels, <clears throat> new networks. Uh, the ability for anyone to innovate has gone down and it, it continues to go down. More technologies, more advanced technologies being more freely available to more and more people uh, keeps feeding this open innovation side, which uh, most effectively happens in the form of startups and in startup ecosystems. So this shows really the, the, the kind of the weight of the activities between different uh, actors. So the old world used to be very simple and linear. There wasn't really multi-dimensional networks and instant connectivity to anything or instant distribution. Uh, there used, used to be no way of individuals to communicate to the whole world as they to, to be able to reach such audiences. Uh, it used to be closed, expensive, less creative, dependency on hosts and gatekeepers. And Ideas and inventions uh, and research by big companies was, was that there was also more need and more use for things like patents and trying to protect those big investments that these big organizations you had to put a lot of resources behind to protect their investments, to get enough time to get the products into the markets and so forth. But because of the accelerating pace of innovation and the cost, uh, it's, it's uh, many of these things that come from past are less and less relevant uh, methods today. Some of them still are, but also the way, for example, how patents are relevant, the, 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 the business game around that has changed significantly from their original purpose and it's mainly uh, something that uh, the, the big companies can play with those because also protecting and executing those uh, patents are getting more and more expensive whereas the innovation and uh, protections through customer base and network effects are getting uh, more achievable. So <clears throat> with this we know that old models are already working at its best. So uh, it's really really hard to improve the old models without completely changing them and that's what is happening in the market uh, and specifically these old models are extremely difficult to improve from outside so basically we can't go uh, if we want to as, as, a, as a government or public sector or bottom-up actors which we can't just walk into companies and and universities and say hey you should change your ways you should do this and this differently but that can happen on the open uh, environment where things are more dynamic and more independent. So it, it, the old world really has less and less innovation impact achieved by outsider strategies and methods. And, and the newer world, and this of course varies a lot depending on what countries or what cities you go between where they are with this kind of older world uh, methods and uh, approaches with, compared to the newer world uh, uh, things already in place because uh, these transitions are measured in decades, not in individual years, so at 10 years transition between these two worlds is, is, is still relatively short time and, and there's big differences uh, in these worlds uh, around innovation in different countries. <clears throat> so the new world is non-linear, it's global, it's very networked, it's fast paced, there's free cheap technology, platforms, channels uh, available for tiny companies, to new companies, to even individual people. And innovation via startups is fast, it's flexible, uh, people are highly driven, highly motivated, highly committed. Uh, because of the lack of resources they have, 
in counterparts. They are extremely cost effective and they are more and more supported by uh, uh, private and public parties. So there's a constant uh, support and there's also a constant demand for more and more innovation invited through uh, these methods of, of new startups. And this makes the whole innovation process more exposed to the markets. It's more open. Uh, basically, as you can imagine in big corporations, how they do innovations in a research lab and you know behind secret tours and you know NDAs and all of that. Uh, whereas startups, they keep running around in the markets. They pitch in events. They share their knowledge through blogs. They communicate openly uh, a lot what they're doing not necessarily from all aspects of their business, but many aspects of their business. And, at the, and in return, they get a lot of feedback, ideas, people are able to follow. Uh, so the whole process, how the innovation actually happens in the marketplace is more uh, open uh, to markets as well. And a lot of big companies are working together and buying most potential startups. So the, the, the newer the big companies are, so the, the more modern they are, the more digital they are, uh, the likes of Facebooks and Googles and Amazons and so forth. So the more they work with startups, and I think we can all kind of understand how Apple and App Store works with developers. Uh, that very similar analogy applies to how smart big companies are working with startups. They see that startups can deliver a lot of new value and a lot of uh, new innovations also for their customers. And once the innovations get validated and mature enough, uh, they are interested in buying these companies. And that is a one typical way, of course, for startup companies to get, get exits and return of investments for them, for their own risks and efforts, as well as potential investors who have joined. Them as well. So it really is outsourced innovation uh, for bigger companies. And new companies, because of the side, side products, new companies are also uh, the biggest job creators. Because it's also logical that you need uh, more people uh, around to push and grow and validate that innovation. But even more clear is that, that once the innovation is validated and there is actually new value created, that new value is genuinely something that both require and can uh, uh, sustain those jobs. So basically there is a need and at the same time there is value being created that can converts to resources to actually be able to um, sustain those jobs and develop them further. Whereas <coughs> if we think on, on bigger companies and organizations that iterative development, while that may uh, increase new value, typically it is only able to sustain value. So basically the, the, there's an expectation that there is a constant innovation because if there is none, uh, there is no ability to also sustain your business anymore in to, to today's market. So there is no uh, situation where you could test day with your existing products and not need to do iterate, iterative innovation. But that iterative innovation, it starts to be to the point where that's not enough anymore. And at the same time, there's other innovations that come to organizations that helps make their uh, operations more efficient and that actually reduces jobs because now with these new technologies and methods, uh, organizations are able to deliver the same value or iterative innovation with less resources. So that is the, 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 the challenge between uh, the, 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 where the jobs are created and where they are not created. Uh, and of course, these are not as black and white. It's, it's, there's always a lot of variety in this, but this point here is to communicate the, the, the bigger picture, the megatrends, uh, and their, their rationale and their impacts. 